2003. At the time, he was working on his master's degree, and I was a first year student getting in trouble in the dorm. He, uh, he whipped me into shape really quick, and oh, then man. he was on the professional staff in the housing office while I was a student staff employee. So I was able to connect with him early and uh, really learn from him. I knew from the get-go that Brown was going to be successful uh, no matter what he did. He had that very dynamic speaking voice. He, uh, he cared. He was engaging when he spoke to an audience, but he also cared when he spoke to the individual. Um, I think that he's passionate towards working with others, towards working for others, and it, it makes sense being the research that he's done um, these past several years at UofL. Um, after leaving Western Kentucky University, he headed down to Miami and he earned his doctoral degree in education at Florida International University. And back in 2010, he joined the staff here at UofL and became a, a Cardinal for Life, we hope. <laughs> Dr. Shuck is very uh, involved with both the Belknap campus as well as the HSC. He serves as the Associate Professor and Program Director of the Health Professions Education Program as well as the, uh, he has the whole same titles in the College of Education. Uh, for the Human Resources and Organizational Development Program. His primary research areas include uh, the application, meaning, and measurement of employee engagement, emerging areas of positive psychology, and leadership development. And he is, his research is commonly cited uh, in outlets such as Forbes, the Washington Post, and Time Magazine. This past fall, Dr. Chuck was invited to India to be a keynote speaker for the SHRM, uh, the Society of Human Resources Management Annual Conference. He spent about seven days over there exploring India, uh, speaking to their to their delegates at the conference, and he has very good stories to share about that. <laughs> um, he's also been invited to speak to several corporations within the United States. We're happy to have him here. Yeah. I've listened to him speak a couple times in uh, different capacities, and I've seen him online. I uh, have his Facebook, I'm sorry, I have his Twitter feed up there. Follow him. He's also on YouTube if you want to get more information after he does speak today. But uh, help me welcome Dr. Brad Shump to the Health Science Campus. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> well, so if you go to YouTube, you need to know that I share my YouTube channel with my daughter. So you're going to see like a seven year old opening up like Kinder Eggs and making oatmeal and. There's something about a, a little girl videotaping herself who wants to have her own YouTube channel and all that kind of cool stuff. So just be aware, like, you're going to see some other crazy things that, that are up there. I am uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. How many of you last were at the last smart presentation on burnout? Just a quick show of hands. So we're going to talk about the opposite of that. But I've not been able to get that topic out of my mind. This idea of burnout, what we do about it, and what's been, what's been kind of marinating in my mind is this, is this idea of capacity. We'll talk about capacity and how do we create space for capacity, but I, I think when we think about burnout, we, we also need to consider the other side of this. So I want to talk to you a little bit about engagement, but I want to ask you to do three things. Sometimes we can think about engagement pretty unilaterally. So we think about it like, well, this is employee engagement and work engagement. But I think there's something to be said about thinking around these three areas. So each one of us in here is a leader of some kind. We influence people, and that's what I'm gonna define as, as a leader, somebody that has influence over a group of people or a team or individuals, right? Even if that's at home, we provide leadership and influence. Someone is listening to us, our neighbors, our communities. Second, as a professional, where are you? Uh, in your own career journey, what does this mean for you? How does this idea of engagement kind of fit with you? And then thirdly, as a person, which is something I think we neglect almost all the time. We don't think about ourselves, particularly in a work context like this. Like, I'm also a human being that does things outside of here. And for example, I'm a dad, right? I'm a drummer, I'm a, I'm a semi-pro musician, I like to play drums on the weekends. Um, you know, and I have challenges and opportunities, but all that stuff is kind of interwoven here, isn't it? We, we can't really dissect that or divorce these identities um, from one another. The context that I want to put on this talk is this question right here. I think it's, it's the question we need to ask. And it's the question that when I talk with companies, this is the essence of what they're talking about. What do we need to do right now to prepare for tomorrow? It's not enough to just wing it. Many people do, right? Many people do wing this. But in my own personal life, when I wing this question, 
things don't go the way I want them to go. They don't go, I'm not able to be, not to be able to be in the place that I want to be in for the people that I work with, for my family, and for myself, right? So this is the question I'm asking you today. Maybe we can take up the word we and put the word you. What do you need to do right now to prepare for tomorrow? And in those areas that I've asked you to think through, personally, professionally, and then as a leader, somebody who has some sense of responsibility here. <coughs> well, let me put some context on why I think this question is a difficult one to answer. So this is my daughter, this Mountain Grace. I know, now you have to like me because I've shown you a picture of my daughter. This is my secret weapon strategy for sure. So Maddie is, uh, she is in the first grade. Uh, we live out in Olden County, but last year in kindergarten, she came home from school and we have a routine at our house. Uh, we do this every day. Uh, I'll, if I'm working from home or I'm coming in the door late, the, the person who hears the door runs to the door, right? And the person coming in the door runs through the door. And we are going to find each other and we're just gonna give a big hug, right? Like, hey, how are you? How was your day? I want her every day to know, like, I want to, I love you. You're the most important thing right now. And let's talk about what's going on in your life. So this particular day, no one came running through the door. And she's dragging her backpack on the ground. And she's, she's obviously very sad, right? And I said, Maddie, what's wrong? Are you okay? And she said, Daddy, it was a really hard day at kindergarten. And so I was like, well, it gets worse. I mean, yeah, right, kindergarten's bad, but first grade, babe, is legit. I mean, second grade, I, it gets worse from here, right? And I said, well, tell me, what, why, why was kindergarten such a tough day? Why was it a hard day? And she said, well, daddy, my teacher told me I need to color like a first grader. And I was like, what is that? Like, what does that mean? What does a first grader color like? And I said, well, show me what you, what you mean. So she pulls out of her backpack this elephant that she has colored. And she's colored the elephant pink and she's drawn some trees and some blue skies and sunshine and things like that. And it, and it looks great. And I said, well, tell me what's wrong with this. And she said, well, Dad, my teacher told me that elephants aren't pink and I shouldn't color elephants pink. They're brown and gray. And if I want to color like a first grader, I need to color things the way they are. Yeah, so I had the same reaction you did. Like, what? I'd, I'd like to talk with your teacher. I think right now, I wish she was here right now so I could talk with her. And I got down on one knee. I promise I did this. I get down on one knee and I'm looking at her in the face and I said, babe, I want you to know that I love pink elephants. Pink elephants are my favorite kind of elephant. And one day we may see a pink elephant and we'll see it together. And I can't wait for that to happen. And tell me about the picture that you draw. Why did you draw sky and, and trees and mountains? And she said, well, I wanted to color a pink elephant because I've never seen one. And I said, well, you, you colored outside the lines a little bit. She said, yeah, I just, I wanted to, to see what the sky would look like with the elephant. For me, it was a really important dad moment to shift the conversation away from things that are being always in the box. We're constantly told to work within these boundaries and these limitations, right? And as a seven-year-old little girl, my daughter was already being placed in those boundaries. I spend the majority of my time as a faculty member trying to help people get outside the boundaries. I try to get them to be creative, but it's a risk because for the majority of our life, we're told we can't do certain things or these limitations on us that are imposed by these other people or they want these things from us and you have to do things within these kind of particular constraints. <sighs> Look, I'm telling you right now, if you want to rethink what you need to do today to prepare for tomorrow, we have to think differently about pink elephants. We have to think, and, and, and I call that the pink elephant philosophy. It's a different way of seeing things. It's a different way of approaching life it's a different way of considering our work. So I'm going to invite you into that conversation to think a little bit about what it might be like for you if you didn't have those constraints. The color inside your lines. And we all have them. We all have them. So I have a fun activity. So my friend uh, Rod Wagner, who used to work for the Gallup organization, now works for a company called BI Worldwide. He has this happy face o meter <laughs> right and if you go to this website workhappier.com and you can do it now you can do it later you're going to slide that happy face and if you slide it up it gets bright and this smiley face gets bigger and if you slide it down it gets sad and depressed and blue 
right? And so this, what's interesting about this for me is it's scientifically connected to the way that you feel at work. So the question is, how happy are you at work? It's going to give you a number. And that number corresponds with 36 individual items around your engagement at work. What's really interesting is we validated this over and over and over and over again across 12 different dimensions. And every time it comes out incredibly robust. So this one indicator, this one visual indicator will tell you, where are you? Where are you right now? It's free. You can do it every day. You can do it every hour if you want. You can use it to talk with your leaders or your managers. I'm getting the email. Does that make anybody else's blood pressure rise? Did you hear that? <laughs> I'm going to unplug that sound because that's going to make me nervous all day because I'm just going to get emails today. So here's why this matters. Let me give you some information. Did anybody get a number that they want to share? You guys are like, I'm not sharing my number. That's my number. It's not your number. I don't know you. You're a stranger. I get it. The number matters. So know your number. Know your number. Here's why that number matters for the university. People who say that they're engaged at work, they give 93% 93, 93 of them say they give more effort. So what you're looking at here, all these dark green bubbles are people that say they're working harder than they have to for their organization. What I find is that engagement is an amazingly resilient construct. It takes a tremendous amount of emotional exhaustion to erode engagement. Once we're there, we tend to work for our patients and for our team members and for our customers. 91% of people who say that they're really highly engaged are not likely to leave. And why would they go anywhere? They have a lot to gain, right? Here's what I think is really interesting. 85% of those people say they give their best ideas. And I've been in lots of meetings before and asked people an important question and nobody raised their hand. Why? Why would you know the answer to a question? Not raise your hand. I don't know about you, but my team needs this. I have a retreat tomorrow uh, at the Get Healthy Now uh, Humana Gym. And we have some really important work to do. We are gonna have a, we have our five year plan. Where's our degree going? What are the courses we need? What's the curriculum we have going on? I need people in that meeting raising their hand. And if I need that, then I need, it's my job as the program director to make sure that my faculty are engaged. And what does that mean? That they count, that they value, they're valued. Their work is really meaningful. It's connected to something beyond just this thing they get a paycheck from, right? A lot of people confuse satisfaction with engagement. Satisfaction is not engagement. Satisfaction is a state of satiation. It's status quo. I don't want satisfied by I don't want satisfied team members. I don't want a satisfying life. Satisfaction is don't change a thing. Don't move anything. Don't change my benefits. Don't change my workspace. I don't want a new stapler. My stapler's just fine. And when you change it, they get upset about that. Engaged, engaged employees, they don't do that. It's an enduring quality. It's an enduring quality. Here is the challenge that we face as, as a country. Uh, this was true when I was over in India a couple of months ago. The number of employees who come to work engaged six months after they're employed is only 40%. There's a 60% drop off between day one and six months later. So 60% of the people are saying this. When I got hired here, I was pumped. I was so excited, I set my clothes out the night before, right? And I listened to my jam on the way to work, and I stopped and I got McDonald's because it was going to be an amazing day. And then six months later, they're dragging in. So we have one of two issues. We have one of two issues. I can only think there's one of two things. We're either hiring really depressing people, right? <laughs> really, really depressing people. Or... We have a culture issue. And this is epidemic. This is, this is not here at the University of Louisville. This is across the country. This is what people say. I see this as a huge opportunity. What if this number was 50%, 55%? We had 10% more people engaged. Think about what the number, what that would do to your teams. What would it look like if 10% more people came to work more engaged than they were the day before? What would that look like? How do we do that? 
One of the problems that we have with this idea of engagement is that people focus on practice. So in my classes, I'll ask students, well, tell me about like, what's the kind of workplace you want to be at, right? And they'll say, oh, Google. And I'll say, what's so special about Google? And they'll be like, oh, they got nap pods. If only had nap pods, it would be amazing. And they'll say, well, tell me what else about Google? Oh, they do, their la they do your laundry. You can just drop your laundry off and then there's free food in the cafeteria. It's not like crappy food. Like it's really good food, right? Like they had gourmet chefs come in and you know how many organizations have gone in and attempted to duplicate Google? And it, it just fails. Because you cannot take a practice out of one context and put it in another context and hope it works. It just doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't work like that. Instead, we have to focus on principles have to focus on principles. Principle drives practice. Practice does not drive principle. I don't miss that because that's really important. I want to talk to you today about four principles that build engagement that we have derived out of our research. Now you'll need to forgive me. I've thought about this for almost 15 years, right? This is the question that I go to bed with. This is the question that I wake up with. And this is how I see the world. I have so much I can tell you. So, so much I can tell you. I'm going to try to keep it in three hours. All right? So, <laughs> need extra material, let me know. I do have a bunch of articles. The other thing I want you to know is that everything I'm going to tell you is evidence-based. I'm not telling you my opinion. I'm going to give you the research and tell you how it works itself out. All right? So, the four principles that I want to talk to you about are the cumulative principle, the reciprocity principle, the why principle and the readiness principle, all right? These cut across context. So they apply in your life, in your home life, in your work life, in your community life, in any other life you've got going on. These things cut across. We call it employee engagement. I'm just going to call it engagement, okay? I'm going to call it health engagement, wellness engagement, resiliency engagement, whatever. So proposition one one. So let me go through it. Proposition number one is the value of experience is cumulative. That is this, that the way that we experience our work or the way that we experience some context is built on the things that are easy to do and the things that are easy not to do, okay? I'm gonna give you an example of this in just a moment. Easy to do and easy not to do. They can work for us or they can work against us. And then third, it feels sudden, but it's oftentimes a gradual build. So let me give you a really personal example. All right, so I'm going to be a little vulnerable here with you guys for a moment. So it's close to the first of the year. Now, listen, I don't eat sweets. I don't ever eat sweets, except in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then it's on. Like, I'll eat anything in front of me, right? I'll eat a whole box of chocolate, a whole box of fudge. I'll eat a whole box of donuts. That's fine with me. So at the beginning of the year, my wife will typically come to me and be like, hey, babe, we're going to go to the beach this summer. I want to go to the gym. Get a little big. Okay, there I get the message, right? She loves me for that, and that's fine. We can give each other hard feedback. So what if I did this? What if I committed to my wife? I was going to go to the gym three times a week. That's easy to do, isn't it? Going to the gym three times a week, I could probably swing that. What if I ate less sweets? I just said, look, I'm just going to lay out the donuts and the fudge for a little bit, right? Just for a little bit. And then what if I ate smaller portions? Sometimes at night when I pick up my dinner plate, I'm like, man, this thing weighs 15 pounds, right? So I want to give you some examples of what that looks like. This is a cinnamon roll that I devoured. This is at Lulu's Cafe in San Antonio. Have you guys heard of this? This is a three pound cinnamon roll. <laughs> I promise you it is a three pound cinnamon roll. They, this icing, they put on with a paintbrush. Like they don't, they don't dip, like it, they're painting it on there, right? And you can see it's all fall off. Right? Well, I decided that wasn't enough. So I decided to also get an order of chicken fried chicken with queso and a double order of french fries. And this is what it looked like when I got done. I mean, I'm telling you. Between Thanksgiving and Christmas, yo, I can eat, right? Like, I can put some food on. So if I did these things, what if I did this for one week? Went to the gym, ate less sweets, ate smaller portions. Are these hard to do? Is it harder to eat smaller portions? 
I, so I had to eat lunch yet. So I'm going to leave here and go eat lunch. And I was debating this on the way here today. You know, what's, you know what I need to do? I need to go eat a salad. You know what's easier? Taco Bell. <laughs> Taco Bell's easier. I just got to drive through. I don't have to, I can take it home. I can put my feet up, right? It's easy to do. These things are not hard to do. If I did that for one week, do you think I'd look like this? Is this possible? <laughs> is, this, is it possible that I, after one week, going to the gym, eating smaller portions? No, it's not possible to do this, right? This is not possible. Why is this not possible? It would take years, wouldn't it? I mean, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I look like that. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't see me at the beach, right? Also, I'm not sure why you're laughing. You don't, you don't think this is possible. I see. It's obscene, isn't it? It's absolutely obscene that for one week, if I ate less sweets, it's small portion. But isn't that how we treat workplace culture? We're going to do one intervention. We're going to do one thing. And we just expect it to work. What happens, though, cultures that build engagement are grounded in the things that are easy to do and easy not to do. It is easy to go to the gym. It is easy to eat smaller portions. It's also easy to just go home. It is easy to say hi to people in the morning. It is easy to check in on them. It is easy to send an email that says, thank you for your hard work. It is easy to do that. But you know what, you know what else is easier? Not sending an email because we're busy. And when we're busy, we get tied up in all these things, right? If we want to build cultures that are engaging, it's built on something that we call the cumulative effect. The second proposition for you is that engagement of any kind is always reciprocal. What do I mean by that? When we engage, we give, we engage with things that we believe give to and take from us. This is based on the theory of reciprocity. Is anybody familiar with the theory of reciprocity? There are two psychology undergraduate majors in here. Thank you very much for your courage, Henry. The idea of the principle of reciprocity is that we give and take from those things that give and take from us, and that we give those things in proportion. And it's freely given, not in exchange, which tells me it's not transactional. Engagement is not transactional. When the university deposits a paycheck in my bank account, that is a transaction. <coughs> We are agreeing that I will do this amount of work for this amount of transaction. That's the agreement that we've made, right? But when people ask me to be engaged, they're asking me to go beyond that, to give effort, creativity, discretion, right? To manage my knowledge better. So it is not an exchange, and it is in proportion. Think about the things that you're in a relationship with right now in your own life. Do you give to those things that you don't see meaning in? No, of course not. Human beings don't do that. We push away from those things. So it is proportionate in intensity. So if I believe in what's happening here, I give more. I don't just put my big toe in it. I'm all in it, right? So this works out. Let me tell you one more story. So this is dinner party reciprocity. So uh, Karen, do you mind? Just play along with me for a second. All right. So Karen and I have been friends for a little while. Um, and let's say that Karen invites us over to her house. All of us. So we're all going to her house <laughs> tonight, right? And we get there, and it's amazing. You have a beautiful home. It's amazing. You have this great dinner laid out. Karen got her good wine out, too. She, I mean, you know, she has a cellar. You guys know this. She got a cellar. She keeps all her really great wine. And she got all her good wine out. And we're coming. And she says, make yourself a home. And she pours all this great wine. Oh, it's an amazing time. And, our spouses and partners are also invited. So we bring them to, everybody's coming to our, Karen's house for a party tonight. It's 7.30? 7.30 it is, 7.30 it is, 7.30 it is. So we go to the party and because Karen's such an amazing host, she has gift, gift bags for us when we leave, right? And they're, they're uh, gender specific. So I've got like a, a little man bag and my wife's got a little girl, like a, a lady bag, right? With lady stuff in it, like a pillow and stuff. And, and we're on the way to our car, right? And what do you think my wife says? <coughs> You ought to have Karen over for dinner. That'd be great. Great to have her. Look, I love Karen. She's great, but I don't want you to come to my house. <laughs> this far away, you're going to have to drive really far. I don't like, I mean, I have to clean my house. I don't want you to drink my good wine. I'm going to save my good wine. That's my good wine, not your good wine. But when Karen comes to my house, what do we do? I clean. I get the good stuff out. Why do I do that? It's reciprocity. We give and take from those things that we believe give and take from us. Same thing works here at work, right? 
we believe someone has our best interest in mind, someone extends for us, there's this idea of reciprocity that almost pulls you toward them to close the loop. So think about this idea of reciprocity. The third principle is this, that a strong collective why will drive individual engagement. I, I, I had somebody ask me, last weekend I, I served uh, at my church on worship team, and we were talking about this idea of why, and uh, we're talking about the, the what of what we do, right? Well, here's what, what do we do, and then why do we do it, right? And a why will all of, always elevate your what. So if you understand your why, it will always elevate your what. Here's the question companies typically ask me. Chuck, why do people engage here? Can you tell me how they engage here? They're not asking me a what question. They're asking me a why question. Here's why people engage. People engage when they believe and they see meaning in the work. So it's our jobs to connect that meaning. They engage when they believe their voice is safe. And they believe, they engage when they believe they can. They have the resources to do that. The idea here is that human beings do not engage in things that they do, do not see meaning in. They back away from those activities. And second, they do not engage with things that they do not believe to be safe. We did a research project here in, uh, here in Jefferson County. Jefferson County Public Schools came to us a couple of years ago and said our teachers are leaving uh, in epi at epidemic levels. Can you help us understand why teachers are leaving the classroom? We said, yeah, yeah, sure, we can help you do that. And so we sent a survey out to teachers and we talked to some teachers and they said, the problem that we have is that teachers are leaving in really high priority schools. The kids that need teachers the most. They need the most love. They need the most care. They need the most attention. These are the kids that when they go home, they may not have a meal until they come to school the next day, right? Have you ever met, so I work in the college of education, have you ever met a newly graduated elementary school teacher? What are they like? On fire, right? They're like putting in the worst classroom, in the worst school, with the worst kids, with no desk, no roof. I'm going to save those kids' lives, right? And I love it. Every year graduation, I'm pumped up because I'm like, this is the, like, this is the group that will save us. Here's what teachers told us. Do you think teachers see meaning in the work? Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, true. That's me. My wife is an elementary school teacher, and I, I, I tell you right now, I've seen her come home at night in absolute tears because of some of the situations. And I've seen her go to work, and her stomach is in absolute knots because of what she knows she's about. She is getting ready to go into battle every day, and yet she does it. You think our teachers are safe? In some places, in other places, no. There's violence and rampant guns and drugs and fights and people getting punched in the face and all kind of crazy stuff that happens in schools. Do teachers still go? Oh yeah, they still go. Yeah, they still go. You know why teachers told us they left? It's massively under-resourced. Massively under-resourced. You need crowns? You gotta go buy them. Your kids need paper? You gotta go buy them. Yo, your kids don't have lunch money? Too bad. One, one student in my wife's class, their family could not afford to buy their kid lunch. And every day they sent a note home in his backpack that said your account is delinquent. What? That's why teachers leave. But you know what? That's why ER doctors leave. That's why faculty leave. That's why policemen quit. And when they don't leave, what is that? What do we call that? Burnout. We call that burnout, right? So if we want people to be engaged, we have to do these things. It builds over time. It's, it's reciprocity. And we have to connect to the why. The fourth principle that I'll give you is this idea of readiness. Connected to the question that I asked you when we started. You must prepare for it before you need it. And I get this from leaders a lot. I'm going to talk really specifically to leaders. So leaders will come in and I say, we have a crisis. We have a turnover epidemic. Like, we have a big problem. Okay. Can you fix it today? No, I cannot fix it today. Because it's cumulative. And it's reciprocal. And we have to fix you. Why? And then we can do that. But they need it right now. If we're going to think about things from a readiness perspective, 
You must think about the future, not the past. And this is where most leaders live. There's a lot of shame here. There's a lot of guilt here. I mean, even as a father, right? Like, I can think back in my own life and think, like, there's some shame and some guilt of decisions that I may have made, maybe events that I wasn't able to be at or something that I prioritized over my family. I must think about the future and not get stuck here. It requires intentional work. So if an organization is coming to me to say, how do we fix our engagement problem? How do we, how do we fix our burnout issue? How do we fix our turnout issue? I say, well, we need to think about what is the intentional work that we must begin to do? What is the messaging that people get every day? Is engagement an objectified artifact? So are we saying, I need you to be more engaged because I need you to work harder and longer hours so that we can make more profit? Look, people don't really care about that. And they, they don't care. They want to do work that's meaningful and that's inspirational and impactful and connected to a why. And you, see, you get my point? It answers the question that I posed to you before I mentioned that. Now, so these are these four principles. Sound good? Do you buy me? Would you buy this book? I don't think I buy this book yet, but I don't even show me any evidence of it, right? Like, so far, all I've told you is like, here are these really four fancy, shiny things that I think are really important about engagement, and they're grounded in these big words, cumulative, reciprocity, readiness, and why, right? Let me show you the evidence. Can I show you some evidence? Do you guys mind? I've got a lot of statistical, like, APA charts. Is that cool? Everybody want to see that? All right. Is there any evidence that this works at all? All right, let me show you this model. This is my favorite model. This is a model of compassion. So a couple of years back, the mayor came to the Louisville Society for Human Resource Management and said, look, we've asked businesses to be more compassionate, and they told us that compassion sounds really fuzzy and soft. Can you help us develop an evidence-based model around compassion, in particular for leaders? We were like, oh yeah, that's our specialty. I mean, we take weird constructs and try to put measurement to it, right? Here's what we did. We went out and we interviewed 31 identified leaders in the community. And then they worked. Some of them worked here at University Hospital. Some of them worked at places like Young and UPS or nonprofits uh, in the area. We interviewed those individuals and we transcribed those, all of those interviews. And then we thematically coded them to identify the things. What was different about the leaders that were identified as, as two things, particularly compassionate leaders? but also high performers. Because we didn't want the leaders that were just hugging everybody, right? Like, that's nice, I like to get a hug, but we also got, we have results we have to achieve, right? What does that look like? And then, and here's what people told us, and I'll tell you the other part of it, and here's what people told us. That compassionate leaders do six things. They treat people with dignity, they're authentic, they have a sense of presence, I'm sorry that yellow box is quite hard to read, they're accountable to themselves and they hold their teams accountable. They work with a sense of empathy and they have a personal integrity that is unwavering. This line here, we call it the courage line. Because to be quite honest with you, it takes a lot of courage to have empathy with someone who you're having a hard time with at work or for a leader to hold a team accountable in some kind of way. This, this courage line it takes a lot of effort and courage sometimes to work above the line. Below the line are behaviors like humiliation, insincerity, detach, avoidance, distracted, dishonest. So just take dignity for a minute. If you're not working from a place of dignity, you could be working from a place of humiliation. And who in here likes to be humiliated? Yeah, that's kind of a thought. How about, um, how about distracted? Does anybody like to work with leaders who are really distracted? can't focus, you're in your one-on-one, -on -one and they're like doing other stuff. I had a manager one time, we would go into a one-on-one, -on -one and she like would sit in front of the computer and just type, and be like, oh yeah, uh-huh, mm, yeah, 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 sure. She had no idea what I was saying, right? These were the behaviors qualitatively that people told us. So what we did, we took all six of these. We identified four behaviorally-based statements connected to the behavior of dignity, authenticity, and so on and so on. And we developed what we call the Compassionate Leader Behavior Index, and then we deployed it. 
Now, we have at this point been working on this project for three years. We get the data back, right? And this is the world that I live in. Here's the data, and my project that I've been working on for three years is either boom or bust, like right now, right? I'm either going to be really sad or I'm going to go pour bourbon and celery. This is going to be amazing. So we run the data. Here's what we find. That those six behaviors explain 14% of the variability in a person's level of engagement. It had a relationship not only with engagement, but satisfaction, effort, well-being, innovation, and creativity, and intent to turnover. It was related to everything in the model. It was average. And at really high levels. I'll, I'll take that all day. Here's what it looked like when leaders promoted that environment, particularly with turnover. All the little black dots that you see there are people that are saying, I like my job, but I think I'm going to go find some other place. All the white and gray dots that you see are people like, no, I'm staying put. The two behaviors that actually drove that were dignity and accountability. Now, that's interesting to me. How much does it cost to treat people with dignity again? <clears throat> Nothing. It doesn't cost anything, right? But I can tell you last night when my wife came home from work and I started work at 630 and she started work at 630 and she was with a group of screaming kids all day and she came in and I was still working and I wasn't listening to what she said. You know what she told me? She said, you didn't hear a word come out of my mouth. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. I didn't hear anything she said. She's my wife. Like I, we've been married almost like 16 years. Like I think my dad sends her a check in the mail every month to like stick around for a little bit longer. <laughs> Dignity is free. And then accountability is what I find to be really, and leaders are oftentimes perplexed by this idea of accountability because it seems like it wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Why? Holding people accountable is mean. No, 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 no. If you don't hold people accountable for results, you emotionally erode the rest of your team. The rest of your team says, well, she can get away with it. Why can't I? Right? And then they start to get upset. And they start to get emotionally exhausted. And then they start to depersonalize work. And then they become cynical. And then all of a sudden, we're like, oh, this is bad. Here's what health looks like. I got so much stuff to tell you guys. Here's what health looks like. So this is the, where the future of my work is going, is the intersection of work and health. And I believe that people who work in places where they can experience high level of high levels of engagement, fundamentally live a different life, and that includes their health. So we started to ask people about what your sleep patterns look like, how much alcohol do you drink, how to do all kinds of things. Look at all these dark circles. These are people that tell us that they're, that they're engaging in very healthy behaviors. The leader behaviors that drove that were dignity, empathy, and accountability. Again, we see that dignity theme and that accountability theme, and here we see the empathetic theme come up. This is not hard. But it is intentional, isn't it? It's very intentional. Engaged employees reported high levels of healthy behavior, such as sleeping patterns, eating healthy, having a sense of overall psychological well-being. They said things like, I'm available for my family. I don't miss events, important events. And they, they drink less. Interestingly, men told us that when they worked in negative environments, they drink a lot more. And women told us that they ate a lot more. They were more likely to eat fast food or eat things that they would consider to be unhealthy. And men were pouring a couple of scotches every night. Not one, but like, hmm, half a bottle, right? And we can talk about why I think that might be the case in a moment. All right, so let me, let me talk to you about another stream of, re, a stream of research. So we have the reciprocal idea of the compassionate leader is something that we call the stinky leader. All right, let me explain why we call him the stinky leader. So we were standing around at the, literally we were at a water cooler with some friends and um, we were talking about these really bad leaders that we had had in our life. And we've had some doozies, right? Everybody in here has probably had some doozies. If your leader's in the room, shit, you just want to shake your head no. You just say, nah, my leader's amazing, right? And so we were talking about that person's effect on our life right now. And how even though we left that person, that they still have impacted our sense of self-esteem, our decision-making, we sometimes will question ourselves. And so we decided to kind of look into that. What we found was that 26, 28 to 36% of employees work with a leader whose approach can be described as dysfunctional. And we use the term stinky because they professionally skunk their employees. And it takes intentional work and healing to remove the stink from your life. Just like, have you ever had a, your dog ever been skunked? My dog's been skunked twice. I'm gonna tell you right now. Wow, 
That's some stuff, right? And it takes bath after bath after bath after bath after bath. Intentional work to heal through the process. The same concept applies right here. So we ask people, what are some of those behaviors? And I'm, gonna, I'm just showing you the whole thing, and I'm going to show you something different in a moment, that we call the stinky taxonomy. So we took all of the behaviors, the bad behaviors that leaders or that employees told us that leaders did, and we, um, we literally plotted them on a graph. So we empirically plotted them from annoyance to traumatic, from low frequency to high frequency. So they happen a lot or they don't happen very much, or these things bother me, but they're just all the way over to these things are really bad. Really bad. Here's the high frequency traumatic category. Look at some of these things. Ignores my opinion, breaks promises, is rude to me, unmanageable workload, impossible deadlines, excessively monitors me. <clears throat> In any one thing, if someone, people are rude to me every day, right? It's not the one time. It's, it's the day after day after day after day after day, right? It's not the one time someone breaks a promise. It's the consistent breaking of promises. And what happens when people do these things to us? Well, we naturally push away, right? We, we just, the safest thing for me to do is push away. Here's what people told us. That when they work in an environment that is dysfunctional, chronically dysfunctional, they have high levels of burnout. They lose significant sleep. They have trouble functioning. Some people told us they reported behaviors like stealing. There was, there's one lady, I love this story about the lady that um, I learned about during my doctor work at FIU. She was an older lady, she was in her mid eighties. She worked at a jewelry store. And uh, she had um, gone through about 10 managers, right? Over about a five year period. And they caught her, uh, she was stealing jewelry from the place. She was, she was lifting jewelry and she was putting it in a shoebox underneath her bed every time. So she didn't wear it, she didn't pawn it. She was just stealing it. And when the police interviewed her, they said, ma'am, why, why did you do this? And she said, well, every time that manager would talk down to me and make me feel less than, I just put a little something in my pocket. And after a while, they got fired. And who's going to suspect the 85-year-old lady stealing jewelry? She said, so I got all those people fired. I'm not saying it's right. I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying I'm, I'm explaining the behavior in the same way that I'm explaining this behavior. We can understand if we, if we go back to the taxonomy. This is what's amazing. The most traumatic of all is ignores my opinion. That's what people told us. Unmanageable workload. Anybody here have an unmanageable workload? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. 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 All right. So you might be saying, well, that's depressing. What do I do about it? All right. We need to talk about something for a moment. So I want to talk with you about burnout for a minute. Spent a lot of time thinking about this. And there are experts in the room beyond me that know a lot more about this idea of burnout than I do. But here's the analogy that I'm going to draw for you. You have a cup. Here's your cup. And you keep pouring into the cup. Eventually, what happens? It spills over, doesn't it? And it gets everywhere. But what happens if it doesn't stop? It just keeps overflowing and overflowing and overflowing and overflowing. Burnout is caused by emotional exhaustion, which is the opposite of being engaged. Now, don't miss that. The opposite of knowing that you matter, that you mean something, that your work is of value, you're an important human being, you're a good person, and that these things build over time they're reciprocal, and they're connected to your why. Once you're emotionally exhausted, oftentimes in the match like burnout inventory, there are three scales. Emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and cynicism. Depersonalization and cynicism are coping mechanisms of emotional exhaustion. You become emotionally eroded, and the coping strategy is to depersonalize. Now, why do we do that? We don't have any more capacity. It is the same reason when my wife came home last night and she, I started working at 6.30, she 
She started work at 6.30. I'm still working when she comes home. I took a 15 minute lunch yesterday. Gets home, house gets crazy. Maddie's screaming at work. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I can't house straight. I just want a glass of wine and sit outside for a minute. And, and then my wife broke her Apple Watch and it was crazy and everybody was crying and snots everywhere and everybody was upset about stuff. And then she tried to tell me about her day. I do not have capacity to hear about your day. I just don't have capacity. So I depersonalize, right? And then she calls me. And I'm like, oh crap. I'm giving a presentation about this tomorrow. So it's kind of a sobering moment for me, right? And then we become cynical about it. And we say it doesn't matter anyway. It doesn't matter anyway. And that's a coping strategy. If you find yourself saying something like that, like you need just be you just need a nudge. You need a nudge. Now if look, I ask my Facebook friends, I do this often, it's super scientific. <laughs> what do we do? I say I said, I'm looking for methods or practices for reducing acute burnout in the heat of battle. Think trauma surgeon in the ER, think elementary school teacher, police officer. In the moment, what do we train folks to do? Now, I've asked questions like this on Facebook a bunch of times. I had 60 people respond. That's a lot. That's a lot. And everything from meditation to resiliency training, some people said take a vacation, some people said take a sabbatical. There's a lot of things, and I'm going to go through this, and I'm, I'm going to find what are the evidence-based practices that help us drive, drive burnout. If you want my thoughts about what to do, I'm going to give you, here are some things that I would suggest to you. To the degree that you can, to the degree that you have capacity, Treat people with dignity and be kind. It doesn't cost anything. I, I get that some people in here are like, well, I don't have a team. I, does it doesn't make you unresponsible for other people that you work with. Just because I don't supervise our UBM doesn't mean I'm not kind to her. I give her a hug every day. I tell her how valuable she is. You know how overworked she is? She has more work on her desk than I could ever do. She never complains about it. She's always smiling. I don't supervise Kelly. But you know what? I love Kelly. So I tell her I love her. I would encourage you to elevate the experiences that matter. If you've not read the book Moments by, Chuck he uh, by Chip and Dan Heath, you need to go to Barnes & Noble today and buy that book. That was recommended by Dr. Rabelais and Stacey Center. You need to go buy his book. It's worth buying. It. It's fantastic. I would encourage you to sharpen your saw. What's that? Uh, it's called Moments. Mo Moments That Matter by Chip and Dan Heath. It is so excellent. It's a really good book. I would encourage you to find ways to sharpen your saw. Go to the gym, eat healthy. I don't know, I don't know, whatever works for you. Go, go to mindfulness training, do yoga, do something for yourself. You can, you have nothing to give if you are not pouring into yourself. You have nothing to give others. I would encourage you, for some of us, we need to look beyond the past, and into the now. What is the future for me? This does not define me. A lot of folks get hung here by guilt, by shame. And then finally, I encourage you to find an anchor. Look, I, I get that these are pedestrian strategies. I, I totally understand that. And if somebody was in front of me like, you need to find an anchor. Like, find somebody that's really important for you. Find your oak tree. Who's that person? I would be like, this guy's a wacko. I just spent an hour of my lunch like, listening to this dude talk. It's not about the one time. This is not about the one time. Like you can't leave here and say hi to somebody at the home and be like, ooh, dignity for the day is done. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's not about elevating the one experience. It's about doing that cumulatively over time. My wife recently won an award. She was named the, what was she named? She was named the Shining Star for, she was the Teacher of the Month for, for Camden Station, right? So she came home, I had flowers and cards and balloons, and she was like, what's this? And I'm like, this is a really big deal, you want a major award. And she was like, I didn't want a major award. And I was like, baby, you want a major award. And she was, she was like, nah, I'm good. And you know how like, she smiles a little bit, you know, like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's, come on, it's safe, it's fine. <laughs> right? And so she won it again. So guess what? She got flowers and cards and balloons. She got all that stuff again because you elevate the experiences and you help people see the meaning. They feel valued. And you can, these are pedestrian things we can do, right? Here's the challenge for you. And then I'll take any questions. I think we have a few minutes left. So here's a 14-day challenge for you. I want you to identify one thing you've heard today. One thing. Just one. Dignity, 
being more present, treating people authentically, being myself. This Don't be a sneaky leader. I hope you don't choose that. That would be a bad choice today. And I want you to connect and reflect and implement that. Just pick one thing. And if you would, if you have a piece of paper and you're taking notes, would you write it down? You just write it down. I commit to doing this in my office. I commit to going to the gym once a week. I commit to not eating three pounds of the rolls. Right? Like whatever your thing is, just commit to doing that one thing for 14 days. And the reason I ask you 14 days is I'm attempting to establish a habit in your life. 14 days is a little short. Typically I would say 21 days. But I feel like this is a pretty this is a pretty expert group of people. So we can do 14 days, right? If you want, if you do that, if you'll take my challenge, and he, here's the thing. I dare you to, I dare you to take it. I, I dare you. If you do it, your life will be different. I promise you that. If you choose to treat people with dignity, your life will be transformed as a result of that. If you choose to be more present when you get home, your life will be different as a result of that. If you choose to come into work with a different kind of attitude, that only I can, inf only you can influence it, right? If you choose that mindset and you do that over time, your life will be different. And I get it. I get the news. I get the bad stuff. I was at home yesterday and watched the announcement about the banner. And I'm really sad about that stuff. I can't change that stuff. You know what I can change though? I can change this. I can give this presentation. I hope you can be changed. Listen, if you want to talk to me more about this, this is, this is my Twitter handle. If you are going to take my challenge, send me a tweet. Tell me about it. What are you going to do? And then in 14 days, follow back up with me. Let me know how it went. Or if you want more information, I have a website. It's, um, it's a little embarrassing, but there it is. But there's a bunch of, like all of our articles on there, the Time Magazine articles, the Washington Post stuff. There's a bunch of extra YouTube clips. So I told you I had a lot of information to tell you, right? I told you. Is there any, are there any questions that I can answer for anyone at this point? Yes, ma'am. Can you say that statement again about not being accountable and your roles and emotional? Mm. Yeah. Say it one more time. Okay, let me see if I can, let me see if I can. Most of the time I'm just winging it up here, ma'am. So I'm gonna try to remember <laughs> what I said, but let me see. So when <coughs> leaders don't hold their team accountable, they erode, they say they don't hold a particular team member accountable for results. They erode the emotional energy of the rest of the team. And does that make sense? Absolutely. Just ding, 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 Now here's the thing with that. And I got into an argument, um, not an argument. I got into a disagreement with somebody in India about this. And they were like, I cannot live up here all the time. That's what I'm not telling you to. I'm saying this is stuff we aspire to, right? And if I'm gonna hold somebody accountable, then I also need to do that from a place of dignity, presence, empathy, and integrity, right? It's not just going in and being like, look, you didn't make quota. Why can't you get through these rooms faster? Is there something wrong with you? Are you not a good doc? What's up with that? Like that's probably not gonna work because we're gonna, that person's gonna be like, oh, oh, hey y'all. Hold on, there, right? So we have to use all of these, or we will come from, or people will leave humiliated, and they'll be they'll avoid you, and so on. That's a great question. Thank you. Other questions? Of that board? Yes, ma'am. And we get a copy of this PowerPoint. I just think, especially this slide right here, appreciate it. Just be something that you can even put up on the refrigerator. Thank you very much. We work really hard on this. Um, I've mm -hmm. seen just personally speaking to you, I've seen this transform my personal life. Um, in the morning, my house is a zoo. We leave the house by 6.30 every day. And if I can get through the morning up here and not down here, I consider that to be a win. But what I love about this for me personally is that it's applicable in so many domains of my life. The other thing is, um, I'm always amazed at how people need to be encouraged. Like how many people do not hear words of affirmation every day? 
And so I, I try when I remember to send texts to, I just have a group of guys that we just kind of can't hold each other and care for each other. And I'll send them a note and just say, hey, look, I just thinking about you guys today, hope you're doing well. And it's amazing what that can do. I, I was at the Delta Sky Lounge. I was going to um, Richmond, Virginia. And there was a lady and she was, I don't know this lady, I'll never see her again in my entire life. But she was working the, um, I happened to be in a lounge. And she was like helping people fix drinks and get soup and salad and stuff like that. And she would, she was the most positive, overwhelmingly happy person I've ever seen in my whole life. And everybody would be like, thank you so much. You're so, you know, have more soup, have this, have this. And she was so happy. And so I went up to her afterwards and I said, I just want you to know, like I've been here for 45 minutes. I just want you to know like what impact you've had on my life. Like, thank you so much for being so kind to everyone. In something that's a totally impersonal environment, this lady starts crying. It's, it's not because I told her, I, I'm not magical, right? There's not, nothing magical about that. It's about people just do not hear that they're loved very often. And they don't get to experience that joy. So when, we, when you can be that person for someone, why would you not do that? You want to get past the symptoms of burnout? That's a really good place to start. And it doesn't cost any money. Well, I hate to guess what time it is. Closing time. I'm around. My, I work here at UofL, uh, so I'm literally at your disposal if you ever need me. Um, you got my Twitter and all that kind of good stuff. I want to thank you for spending your lunch time with me. It's a gift that you did that. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Tom, can I, is there anything else? Should I say thank you? This has been recorded and we can yes. share the link up there. It's been recorded. Now I can't deny anything. <laughs> All those stories I told about my wife, look, we, I thought we were going to keep that in here. But I see that we're not going to, which is fine. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys have a great day. Dr. Shuck for coming and giving us a talk. Next month's talk is going to be about financial planning. So grab someone oh. and bring them with you. Googling it, and I couldn't find the name, or I'm maybe not able to understand the name. Oh, I saw that one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank it's you worth so the read. Yeah, I would like that. Because, uh, like, I, don't know. I have a department that structure is not really there. Mm. And you can tell Barbara it's all there. And I don't know that you need all right to me. So I feel like it's so my goal for the day was to. I'm a planner, so I'm really going to try my hardest to not get sucked into that.
yeah. and complain, even though I can't control the situation, but I'm going to try to, try to. So I appreciate this. I You're welcome. Saw it, I'm like, I'm going to that. If I can do anything for you, I'll let you know. Yeah, for sure. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You so much. And hit me on Twitter, all right? I will. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Oh, well, well, man, this is a robo. We, yeah, one okay. It's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The thing is, Barbara sees it. And people want to present the patient. It's not as much that. I just think it hits on for a lot of people. Oh, they, sure does. they look at their current situation and their situation differently. So, yeah. yeah, it may be ground up effort um, just to kind of change things for the different departments. But I think it's in some areas, this is definitely a uh, much more change. It's a, it's a culture issue. It's a, capa it's a capacity <laughs> issue. It's just a capacity issue. Um, but in you know, a point in case, for me, where I'm at, my chair, yeah. Jeff, is a great guy. He's a, um, he cares a lot about his team, but he doesn't have the capacity to tell people that. So we, we, we went, recently went through the review process, mm -hmm. and it was really cold and disconnected and personal, and all, you know, all the literature says, like, this is your opportunity. You got galvanize your team here. Right. And he, he, he just didn't happen because he didn't have, he couldn't. He just physically he couldn't do it. He didn't have any more facts. Yeah, my wife came home. She works at Yum. She came home two days ago. Last night, she goes, "See, I get to come home." She's like, "Yeah, I got my performance evaluation." And they get the printouts. They have a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the director of advisor, and they write everything out. Like they have comments and suggestions. And it was being clean. You know, our student suits talking, she talks about it. Great reviews. And I was like, "Yeah, it's not what we had." Something like that. Yeah, all right. Our evaluation is like, can you fill this out? Score yourself. That's exactly right. Yeah. Hand it back to me. I'm like, I we get no feedback. There's no positive reinforcement. There's no. I mean, my director of advisors on leave right now. And even when she's here, she's like, it kind of feels as if sometimes they're only checking on you if they know something's going wrong. Yeah. It's not that, like, hey, we want to make sure everything's well. I want to make sure there's nothing I can doing, you know, how are you doing, you know, just, it's always been something bad when they come around, it's not necessarily, that's where right. things are going for. Mm -hmm. And we've heard that exact same thing from the MD of supervised workers. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, it's like the only time we can say anything to them is when they do something wrong, and it's like. Because you're going to kill somebody. Exactly. Correct. And go with your faulty yeah. comments, and one of the biggest reasons oh, that no. I see a lot of people not speaking get here is because they don't have <laughs> Is all this yours? Yeah, good deal. The power of moments. I'm like, oh, I guess so I will see you. Get that on Monday. Monday. I will see you on Monday. Absolutely. For a rousing last night of class. Oh, I can't believe it. You won't keep getting up and getting ready.